Thank you. We have a lecture now on the remainder of clear procedure. We're going to wrap it all up. And these boring technical details can get over with and we can have something interesting. Uh, there are only two processes which clear people. Don't forget it. If they don't work, they aren't being run right. That's, that's, we have to look that over as a, as a fact. Because each time I found them not running, they were not being run right. That is to say, the various items which I've been taking up with you, such as bad auditing, ARC breaks, present time problem in re-stimulation, not starting a session, you know, and skipping the, uh, all of this and that, falling off of the chair and telling the pre-clear that he did it. Uh, it, it takes something to make these things unworkable, or some offbeat command is being used or the command isn't being cleared and was never understood by the pre-clear in the first place. See, those things could all happen. Processes which clear people are help and what we call step six. We used to call step six is that there was a book, clear procedure, and that's step six of that book. The whole first step of that first clear procedure, issue one, was devoted to participation of the pre-clear in the session. And this, oddly enough, adds up to nothing more serious than help. How do you secure his participation? Help, of course. Well, step six, run subjectively, that is, with mock-ups, mental image pictures, mock-ups on the basis of keeping them from going away holding them still and making them more solid. And if you will notice, this is devoted to making creation possible. I'll go into that in a moment, or if you want to understand that even yet. And this is devoted to creating. This makes creation by the PC possible, and this is creation betterment. And you could run help step six, help step six, help step six, help step six, and you'd eventually get somewhere. But that's the way you more or less do it. Run help on some things and get it more or less flat, and then run some step six and, and uh, get that in pretty good shape, and run some more help, and then run some more step six, run some more help, and somewhere up along the line. He said, I, I just found out something. He probably doesn't know this. You better write Ron uh, and tell him because, you know, <laughs> You know all those engrams and facsimiles? You know, I'm locking all them up. <laughs> you say, no kidding. You, you want to be, you want to be, don't lead him with that one, you know. Telling the pre-clear what to think, do, believe, and cognite on is not part of the game of auditing. No matter how tempting it is. The time-worn example of the fellow who sat there with a bad leg I managed to audit him long enough so that he cognited on the fact that he had a bad leg. But it was obvious to me that he had a bad leg. But it wasn't obvious to him. When you start evaluating the preclear and telling him what to cognite on, why, uh, if you find you must do this, you have two recourses. One, get audited. <laughs> And if you can't or won't do that, take up hypnotism. <laughs> if you have no success with that, you might as well go all the way south and take up psychoanalysis. <laughs> now, uh, help and step six, then, are the processes which clear people. And any other process is simply subsidiary, auxiliary, and makes auditing possible. All other processes make auditing possible. These processes clear people. Got that? So sometimes you have to run some other processes to make auditing possible. But don't think you're clearing anybody because you're not. You're merely making clearing possible when you get around to it. Because you could run the other processes we have some hundreds of thousands of hours without clearing anybody. All you're doing is setting a pre-clear up to become able 
to run these two processes. Now, how would you, what do I mean by setting them up? We had an old process been demonstrated right here to Congress called SCS. Stop, change, start, change, and stop. Now, SCS, in its milder version or its more serious version, stop CS, which is just emphasis on stop, of course, are the elements of control. And these elements of control are very definitely part and parcel to an auditing session. If you think the preclear is going to be uncontrollable on a body process like 8C, which is a good control process, the only trouble with 8C is you start to run 8C, which is guiding them around the room, which is part of the upper train things. If you start guiding them around the room, feeling the walls and that sort of thing, if he turns on a somatic or gets a re-stimulation because of it, you are saddled with flattening it. You have to flatten it. <laughs> it might take you the next 75 hours. It's all right, it's a good process, it doesn't clear anybody. If you start it, you have to flatten it because the preclear make no further advance because life itself goes on running the process. Every time he sees a wall, he gets a somatic. Get the idea? You've just thrown him up into being set up to be run by life. That's why we don't talk too much about HC these days, although it's a very valuable process. SCS is less susceptible to these somatics and does the thing we want to have happen. It puts the preclear under the auditor's control. And if you think that he's going to be a little bit difficult to control physically, think how difficult he will be to control when you can't see what he's doing. You say, well, he couldn't run any, he, he didn't, didn't handle stop CS, couldn't handle that at all. It, it, it annoyed him. <laughs> so I went immediately into step six. <laughs> And I say, well, mock up a small object in front of you, and of course he did, and so forth. And we ran it for 872 hours. Didn't seem to do anything for him. <laughs> now, why? He was doing something that we could not directly observe. If he couldn't be controlled in the body, believe me, he can't be controlled in the mind. And the auditor has to control his mental actions. And that's why you run SCS. It just uh, tells the person to start the body and... Uh, uh, change the position of the body and stop the body on command. After he's done that, these are the three elements of control. He, of course, has the idea that he can be controlled, and he can be controlled, and he's better off for it because he can control himself now, too. People who can't be controlled can't themselves control. I don't know that the first lesson a person must learn in order to command is to learn to obey. I don't know if that's true, but I certainly know that it's directly true that if a person would control, he has to be capable of being controlled himself. You don't get a stuck flow on this and have it work out. So if a person is going to do something in a hidden way, you're going to say, mock up a cat. And he says, mm-hmm. Well, did he or didn't he? If he can't be controlled, I will inform you that maybe he did and maybe he didn't, but probably he didn't. And you would be running a mental image process, this step six, You'd be running this thing without the preclear doing the process. You, you see that then the preclear wouldn't be getting clear on clear procedure because he isn't doing clear procedure. The auditor is running clear procedure, but the preclear isn't. And it probably clear the auditor, but <laughs> <laughs> therefore, therefore, SCS becomes an intimate part of clear procedure, but it's just an auxiliary process. It isn't going to do anything for him that uh, this can do, but it makes it possible to run him. So old SCS. SCS, by the way, is a pretty good process all by itself, and the only trouble with running an auxiliary Scientology process today is that they're so good. <laughs> the old ones, they worked well, they, they did well, and you can say, boy, am I making gains, you know? And you can just run that 8C and run that 8C or run that SCS. The PC's feeling better. He's more capable of taking care of life. He's just getting along splendidly. And you say, well, let's, let's continue on this basis. No, it's practically a matter of why waste your time. They're just auxiliaries to this. You can be trapped into the goodness of the thing. Now... The other one is connectedness, and connectedness is the broad process which covers havingness. 
It's, you get the idea of making that wall connect with you. It's not, you get the idea of connecting with that wall, you get the idea of connecting with the floor, you get the idea of connecting with the ceiling, you get the idea in the pre-clearing house, da, 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 da. Mm. And gone. Because we have a valuable formula operating here. The formula for operating Thetan, which we'll talk about later, is the person capable of being at cause over life, matter, energy, space, and time. Being at cause. And when in doubt, always put the pre-cleared cause over the situation. He's being victimized by a circuit. The long way to do it is just have him cause circuits. So he's being victimized by the circuit, so he's being the effect of the circuit. So the thing to do is to turn around and make him the cause of a circuit. Put him at cause. Put the individual at cause, and you will always advance him. Now, we, we said the individual, didn't we? We mean the Thetan. The funny part of the body is, and this is a total aside, it would much rather be an effect. How a body loves effects. <laughs> oh, if someone would only hit me over the head with a sledgehammer, a body thinks. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be kind of them? If bodies could think, that was sort of the way that they would think about it. And a Thetan becomes deluded into believing that the ambitions of the body are the ambitions of the self. So they go around and try to find varied and fancy effects. But the road out is cause, not effect. In Scientology, we have cause, distance, effect as being the most vital simplicity we have. What do we mean by cause? We merely mean emanation point. What do we mean by effect? We mean receipt point. What do we mean by distance? We mean the space between. When cause and effect are on the same point, you have a nut. <laughs> you get somebody saying, uh, well, I don't know why I victimized myself this way. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting, interesting question for somebody to ask himself? Actually, he's being another cause, but he's also being the effect at the same time, and he doesn't know whether he's the cause point or the effect point, but probably he's both, but it's obvious to him that somebody is doing something to something and that they're both occurring at the same place. His sole effort to get the cause point in the thing is to say, I wonder why I am victimizing myself. And he'll make an actual effort to get the cause. There are people who obsessively assume responsibility. There's nothing wrong with assuming all the responsibility in the world so long as you are assuming the responsibility. When you're reactively taking over responsibility and you don't know that you're taking it over, you get an entirely different picture. You get something very amusing. Uh, a fellow gets hit by a railroad train out in California. Uh, the person commenting or hearing about it is in Rhode Island, and they say, I wonder why I let him go out that night. You say to the person, you wonder why you let him go out that night. Did you talk to them that night? No, but I might have. Uh, well, did you think you should have called them that night? Well, no. Have you called the person for years? No. Uh, well, uh, how did you, pre would, could you have prevented him from going out that night? Well, I just could have. You press it a little bit further. Well, it's just my fault. I... I killed him. Now, the people actually walking around guilty of murders they never committed. That's obsessive responsibility. Responsibility gone totally out of control. No longer able to define responsibility at all. They're being reactively responsible for all sorts of things. By the way, when you run, what part of that problem could you be responsible for? You were really merely erasing the reactive responsibilities for that part of the problem. The person eventually comes up to really taking some responsibility. But obsessively they will say, well, I'm responsible for the sun, the moon, the stars, for God. I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot of ministers and preachers in the past who themselves personally invented God. I'm sure this is the case, because it's true. Anyway, <clears throat> no, nobody got that. Do a calm lag on that one. Anyway. <laughs> Where we, have, where we have cause, PC at, we have things running along fine. 
where we have the PC causing something over here and thinking he's the effect over here, and then not taking any responsibility for the actual causing of the thing, we let him get him in the vast mystery known as being an aboree. And he's in that mysterious state of not knowing whereof, wherefore, my mother is mocking up this facsimile and is punishing me with it. This mental image picture of birth is totally responsible for my horrible condition, don't you see? And somebody else or something else is mocking it up. It took us in Scientology, there's no reason to laugh that people are in this state, but it took us in Dianetics and Scientology years to get around to the actual proof of the fact that the individual is mocking up his whole and entire bank. There is a proof. Do you want to know what the proof is? It might, might be interesting. When an individual's ability to mock up, to create mental image pictures, is improved, the bank improves proportionately. Isn't that cute? Isn't that, isn't that interesting? So we improve somebody's ability to create mental image pictures and his facsimiles get better. You'd say, well, maybe we really improved his vision. No, the only thing we worked on was his ability to create. I'll show you another way this is done. By running help on him, we improve his ability to create. I'll tell you why that is in a moment. We uh, improve his ability to create, and we then get him to create for a very short time, and then get him to look at a facsimile. It's much brighter, much brighter. Facsimile is much brighter. So then we further improve his ability to create, and then we run a little bit more creativeness, then we get him to look at the same facsimile. It's broader, and it's bigger, and it's fatter, and it's solider. So we run some more help and some more step six on him, and we get him to look at the same facsimile. This is an actual test, been run many times. Boy, is that the fattest, solidest engram you ever saw. Now, here is a place in a case processing and clearing where the person would rather be dead. All the facsimiles that he puts up are much more solid than they ever have been before and much more real with many more perceptions in them. Only he doesn't yet know he's making them, so he becomes the victim of them and they're this tougher. So somewhere along the line of clearing, you may pretty clear possibly had asthma or something. This isn't necessarily true because the smoothness of auditing takes the curse off of this. That's why you have to audit smoothly. So please listen. <laughs> audit smoothly. Otherwise, this hump cannot be passed. The PC will start up toward it and say, that's too much for me. Fall off the ledge and skip it. He'll just run. he find another auditor. The auditor runs some more help on him, patch up auditing and so forth, take him over the hump. This could happen, you see, but the reason it would happen is that the individual is, can be, victimized thoroughly. He gets so good at these engrams, locks, secondaries, these mental image pictures get so much bigger and so much fatter, and his psychosomatics can get so much worse that only smooth auditing takes the curse off and gets him over the hump. And then all of a sudden, he realizes he's beginning to, to realize that he's mocking these things up himself. At that moment, he had the smell of ether from the operation, you know. He could smell the ether. He, you know, that's a funny thing. I, you smell any ether in this room? <laughs> now, if you were playing dirty pool and doing bad auditing or research work, something like that, You'd say, <laughs> you'd say, look up, as he smelled the ether, you know, and he'd say, <laughs> how did I get back in this operating room? Because if he was stuck in a facsimile or an engram of an operation, he'll get the whole thing back again, twice as, twice as good as real. The usual thing is PC doesn't flinch or wince or go into a bad condition because of this. He, he ordinarily perseveres and goes on through, and smooth auditing doesn't really kick these engrams into re-stimulation. 
Here's where, here's where you actually get the most wallop out of a case. You start separating valences or circuits with help. And uh, half of the preclear's body falls off at the right side and half falls off at the left side. And uh, he finds himself in a totally strange body. He says, where does this body, where did this body come from? You know, hands, hands. And he realizes he's always thought of himself as having had talons or something. He says, where did I get this body? You know, it's just like coming at the present time. <laughs> he's been going around in that body that was so successful back there in 1710. Now, uh, uh, that, that's more spectacular, but this can become quite interesting. You, you start running it up and... They get better and better and better. That's why you run help, step six, help, step six, help, step six, back and forth. That's one of the best reasons why you vary between the two, because you never hit this hump head on. Now, what is all this about create? What does creation have to do with clearing? Well, that's a stupid question. <laughs> what does it have to do with clearing? It has everything to do with clearing, of course. The person is creating an aberrated state, creating an aberrative bank. He's creating uh, a Freudian unconscious. I knew a fellow one time, ran across a fellow one time that was creating a Freudian subconscious. It was complete. He read about it in a book, and after that he created it. Anyway, uh, it's complete. He was a perfect textbook case. And as soon as I ran where he read the textbook and where he was now, about eight or nine commands, he ceased to be a good Freudian case, so we got on and fixed him up. Now, where creation is unknown, unknowing, sub rosa, PCs here, and some mysterious force is creating from over here, over which, of course, he has no control or responsibility for, we get a reactive bank. We actually get mental image pictures, one kind or another, at which the preclear is not looking, but which are, which are really terrorizing and doing all sorts of things to him. These things can contain anything and do. Now, we have to get him to take over the responsibility for creation. So this is a little bit broader statement than saying, get him to create. See, We have to take, get him to take over the responsibility for his action of creation. Well, we do that by separating out all of the items, all the major items, that he has used to assist himself to create. You got that? That's why you run help, and it's the only reason you run help. It's not to make him a better boy. He'll become a better boy. He's okay, but as long as he's in this aberrated, cross mock-up, riff-raff state, he, he's a mess. You don't even have to make a pre-clear better to clear him. When, when he's clear, he will be much better because, fortunately, uh, a Thetan is basically good. That just stands in our favor. He might as well be basically evil. He doesn't happen to be. He's, from our standards, he's basically good. The better he gets, the more able he is to operate on an optimum solution, which is the best uh, that can be done for each one of the dynamics. In other words, an optimum solution's definition is simply this. It's the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics, and a Thetan in good shape starts operating on that basis. So right up to the point of his getting clear, he could be a stinker, and he'd suddenly be a saint. You get the idea? But he doesn't have to be a saint, and after he'd lived for a little while, he'd find out that was a bore, and he'd settle back to being a Scientologist. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, we have to examine if responsibility for creativeness is so important, then we have to examine the things that are impeding his creativeness. And we find out that the things which first helped him and then sought to destroy him are aberrative only so long as they impeded or assisted and impeded his creativeness. Uh, the, son who, who, uh, the son who, for instance, uh, has a mother who was a painter. And he goes along for years and he can't paint a lick. He can't do a thing with a paintbrush. 
It's just a wonder to him. It's an utter marvel to him, the fact that he cannot paint anything. One fine day, his mother dies, and he can paint suddenly. Oh, well, he says, the competition's removed and so forth. No, it isn't quite that simple. He t Mother's valence was the one that could paint, and Mother's valence came in, snap, only he wasn't himself anymore. Mother also had bunions, so now he's got bunions. You get the idea? He's not being himself. He's, he's, he's gotten a new being this, through the mechanism of life continuum or something of the sort. But his mother helped him paint when he was a little boy. See? Also knocked his head off every time he spilled a paint pot. So she was also creative and destructive, but the creativeness tended to overwhelm him just a little bit, and you run help on mother, and you would get rid of this particular combination. Why would you run help on mother? To make him feel better? No. To because mother was a bad woman? No. Because you want to make him sane? No. None of those reasons at all. You're running help on mother to increase his ability to create himself. And so you run help on mother, and that gets mother off the case of surveillance, and you'll find out he can do a little bit better step six. But I'm going to let you in on a terrible secret, and for years now we've had to be very careful, and we haven't wanted to offend anybody with past lives. I know it's very hard for people to face the fact that they've lived before. I know it's very bad. As a matter of fact, it's blasphemous. Because you know that when you're dead, you go to heaven or go to hell. And that's the end of you, isn't it? That gets rid of you complete. <laughs> well, unfortunately, no research has been able to discover the whereabouts of these two places. <laughs> Although I was in a place one time, I identified with the latter. <laughs> uh, now... What does a person do? Well, clearing people is a path of truth, not, a tri a, a, not, not falsity. It's a path of truth. If you don't have any reality on past lives, then get somebody to run you on how you could help a dead body. And you will wonder how on earth you got so much stuff on dead bodies. You've only lost a couple of relatives. Where did all these dead bodies come from? You can run that for quite a while. You can run it up to a point where you have vivid recall. By the way, this is the way to turn on full track memory. Anybody who says, I don't believe in past lives, I don't have anything to do with past lives, I've never had any past lives. What's the idea of publishing something on the subject of past lives? Past lives, it's terrible. <laughs> you know, we're all born from a mass of myelin sheathing, and, and, uh, <laughs> and when we were dead, we're dead, and that's that. Hey, you know, an old physics professor I ran into recently died a very short time ago, and uh, he, he, he lived out his own prophecy. He said, well, he said, I'll die, he says, before they have an atomic war, and then it won't make any difference to me. <laughs> Get the horrible trap this lie puts out there for somebody. He says, I want to be shot of it all. I want no responsibility for this civilization. I want to do nothing for it, because when I'm dead, I'm dead from there on out, and I don't have to be victimized at all. Toward the end of his life, why a fascism moves in or... They elect more Republicans or something. And you get the whole society sort of caving in at the edges and things falling apart, and somebody passes a law, and he, he, he was right there in the assembly house, you see, and he had friends. All he had to do was say, Joe, for heaven's sakes, an educational law that forces a child to go to school at 6 o'clock in the morning and study till 10.30 at night so that he can become a scientist. Oh, you know that's never going to make him a scientist. He could have said that, but he didn't. So he gets born again, kicks the bucket, picks up a new bucket, you know, gets born again, finds himself walking up to a school, steps at 6 o'clock in the morning.
the horrible poetry of it all. <laughs> well, where we, where we look over man's idiocies in this particular line, we discover that the person who says there can be no such thing can run the least easily. How could you help a dead body? How could a dead body help you? Isn't that an interesting coordination? It's an immediate coordination. The person says, past life, blah, blah, ask him, now, come on, right now, right now, right here, how could a dead body help you? You put him in the nicest calm lag you ever heard of. That's the one thing he's trying to escape, is that dead body. And he thinks, even if he thinks a thought about that light, he'll be dead again. And so he's busy mocking up this dead body all the time. He's creating a dead body all the time so that he can stay away from it, which is one, <laughs> one way of doing it. But he's at the same time inhibiting the mock-up and putting a cap on the mock-up so that at no time will the mock-up ever spring into his view while he mocks it up. <laughs> so that nearly everything a Thetan isn't looking at in his own subjective universe actually is, has these two things going on. It's being mocked up and it's being blanked out. And sometimes a person is awfully hard put to blank out all the things he mocks up. He can get so hard put, they have to electric shock him. I don't know what that has to do with it at all, but they do it. Now, the individual's ability to create, his news, has not been impeded in the present lifetime. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, because if it didn't, if it was the, if it didn't make any difference, I would skip it. But it happens to be the difference between clearing people and not clearing people. Nobody's forcing you to accept this as a concept. All you have to do is accept it intellectually and use it in clearing. <laughs> Boy, that'll hang you with it. <laughs> but the point is simply this, that if we, if we use only factors which he's met in his present lifetime, the only thing we'll achieve is an assist. He'll be all right for this environment. But that's all he'll be all right for. Now we suddenly shift his environment, and what do we get? He spins in. Why? Honest, I'm afraid there's not an... I know you've been in terrible straits in this lifetime. I, I know it's been rough. But do you know there hasn't anything happened in this whole lifetime of sufficient magnitude to aberrate you? I'll tell you why, because you're alive, you're here. So it's obvious, you're still sane. Why, you've had lifetimes when you went, when, when the lights finally went out, you were nutty than a fruitcake, you know it. <laughs> a lifetime that didn't even make you stark staring mad is hardly any dress at all. And we face this fact in clearing, and, and, I'm, and, and those people who are attempting clearing, walking the nice little tight rope of one life, and I'm born into it, and I die out of it, and that's it, aren't making the grade. They're just not getting anywhere. You can't clear a person by running help on his wife, Agnes. You get the idea? You'd have to run help on a wife. You never have to acquaint the pre-clear with past lives. You all of a sudden, what's this old hag doing here? You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you have to run help on a wife, a man, a woman, a husband, a baby. You don't mess around with this stuff of uh, run help on Joe and Bill and Pete and his wife Agnes or her husband Joe. See, just don't, don't fool around with it because you've got the person pegged right here and he'll be way up here on top. Remember basic, basic on old dianetic chains, huh? Well, you're auditing way up here on top of a tremendous chain of events which have experiences by the tens of thousands preceding it. And his voice is as sticky as though it's in solid tar. And you audit his wife, Agnes, for hours and hours and hours and hours, and he feels a little bit better about Agnes. He hopes. 
<laughs> His wife, Agnes, only drinks and runs around with other men. There's nothing she does that's aberrative. <laughs> how, 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 about, how about the woman he married back in the Roman Empire? The fourth time she tried to murder him, and he found out about it. He found out that also his worst enemy was in on it as her lover. And when he reported it to the Senate, he found out that the master at arms was also in on the plot. <laughs> and about the time he was totally outraged, the emperor had him fed to the lions. <laughs> and just as they swished him out the gate into the maw of their largest and best black-maned lion, who wasn't feeling well that day and took two hours to kill him, we got a situation where the guard said, that'll teach you to get married. So, the long and short of the situation is that people don't get aberrated in this lifetime. That's all there is to it. They just don't get aberrated in one lifetime. It takes longer than that. Fortunately, it doesn't take longer than that to clear them. Now, that's news for you. If it took more than one lifetime to clear somebody, we'd have had it. It doesn't even take a lifetime. If you're a very good auditor, it doesn't take a month. Very good. And the preacher is very cooperative and nothing odd happens in that month like getting somebody shot or something. The reason people go on and on and on and on and on with auditing toward Claire is because they're not auditing the vital points that should be audited. Now we'll get on to this other mock-up thing. Why can't this individual do mock-ups? Why can't he do mock-ups? That is, say, when you say cat, why can't he put a cat out there in front of him easily? Why does he have a screen in front of him or an invisibility or a this or a that? What, what's the matter there? What's impeding this ability to mock-up? He isn't doing it. He's doing it on a circuit. That's what's impeding it. He has somebody over here mock up something over here. And he's busy mocking up this person here. But there's something else going on that's very important in clearing. Remember we used to say, if you could get the mind to do what the mind is doing, the whole problem would come to pieces. Well, I finally found out what the mind is doing. It is obsessively mocking up a certain set of mock-ups. And if you can get the mind to mock up what it is mocking up, your preclear will have reality. But if you ask somebody to mock up something he isn't mocking up, he has no reality on it. Therefore, you can take a very aberrated preclear and run step six all the way around and so forth, and mock up this, mock up that. Well, he isn't mocking those things up, so he doesn't mock those things up, and he doesn't get very far. But we ask him to run 8C, and he walks around. He can do 8C, you know, slaps this wall, nothing to it, so on. Totally unreal, everything's unreal. Run concepts, totally unreal. Straight wire, totally unreal. You've got a pre-clear that week after week of auditing simply sits there and says, yes, it's pleasant, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening, but it's all right. Well, any time you've had that case where nothing's happening, you haven't asked him to mock up what he's mocking up. Only it would be too catastrophic to do so. So you run help on it. You find out what he's mocking up obsessively. Now, every mock-up that goes out there is being put up by this figure. Well, we try to find this figure in this lifetime. Who is this personality, this valence, that does his mock-ups for him? Now, who is that person? 
We try to find it in this lifetime, and this is why I tell you past lives, I'm, I'm afraid if you're going to clear anybody, you have to recognize this fact and find some subjective reality on it. Because the, so far, we've never found a current lifetime personality guilty. It's always somebody back there eight planets ago or something of the sort with a bunch of half a billion personalities stacked on top of it. And there's real duress. And he just goes on obsessively mocking up this mock-up. And this mock-up then does things for him. In other words, it helps him. Basically, it helps him create things. He knows it's a winning mock-up because it killed him. <laughs> That's how he knows it's a winning mock-up. Best test in the world. You see how that would be? We ask him to mock up or do anything else but mock that thing up, and he tells us it's all unreal and nothing is happening. And he is auditing this mock-up in some fashion while we're auditing him. And if we don't get in there and figure out what kind of a mock-up he's mocking up, we're not going to get very far. We should run help on it. How could you help that? Now, it, you merely have to have a type of thing. You don't have to know where it is on the track. You don't have to know what it is. You don't have to know the name, rank, and serial number of the last Roman soldier that pierced his gullet after raping his wife. You don't have to know these things in specific detail. It'll fall to pieces on helping soldiers. You know, how would you help a soldier? Oh, he thinks of soldiers he's known in this lifetime, the last war, and so forth. He thinks of a soldier here and a soldier there. All of a sudden, sort of dim, rather unreal, but uh, it has to do with soldiers somewhere else, sometime or another. Must have read about it in the book. Here he goes with soldiers, 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 one kind or another, running help on them and them helping him, and all of a sudden, wow, something happens. Something starts to move out of his body, or something starts to go this way or that way, and he all of a sudden is different, and he's suddenly able to mock up something. A field, a whole black screen that he wore between himself and his mock-ups and bank and so on disappears. That requires judgment, and it also requires the use of a generality. I found a person one time that was very, very certain that women were the most aberrative thing in the world because he went out every two weeks and found himself a new girl and would tear around for a couple of weeks and find another girl and tear around for a couple of weeks and find another girl. And when I got down to what he was stuck in and what he was obsessively mocking up, so help me, it was a house. <laughs> he couldn't stay home. That's certainly a far cry from women, isn't it? <laughs> I have a rule on it. Whatever the preclear says it is, I use something else. <laughs> if he knew that much about it, it wouldn't be aberrative. Now, men and women are a method of creating new bodies. And his dependency on men and women for the creation of new bodies has rendered him incapable of mocking up a body that you or I could see. Now we're talking about OT, operating Satan levels. He doesn't any longer mock up a body whenever he needs to be recognized because men and women mock up bodies for him according to a certain set of rules which are laid down in this district uh, obstetric code and Freudian analysis if they don't know how. Now, here you have this, this thing, though, this, this new uh, proposition of creativeness. He's dependent on men and women to create. Well, the funny part of it is you might run help on men in brackets and run help on women in brackets and not get any place, and all of a sudden hit a gold mine on a baby, you see. But uh, this, this then cleared up and all of a sudden the way he went. It requires a certain amount of judgment. You have to look for something on the case. Now an e-meter is of assistance to a certain degree on handling cases. Its greatest assistance, however, is not necessarily the location. There's an e-meter. The location 
of a, a thing on the track or something like that can be spotted with an e-meter, and they have many uses. But its main use is to know whether or not the preclear is still under control. Now, the manifestation on an e-meter, when you strike one of these valences I'm talking about, obsessive mock-up, you realize that an obsessive mock-up is more mass on the person and therefore more resistance, more electrical resistance, not emotional, but electrical resistance, and you get a stuck. The needle starts to stick. And the longer you guess, the more the needle sticks. You just start piling stuff up on the stuck spot. So you better take the first thing you had that it got stuck on and run help on it. Needles seemed to be nice and free until you started talking about young boys. And he's had it. Needle all of a sudden started to get stiff. You insisted on talking about it a little bit further, and you mentioned young girls, and it got about the same. Then you talked about men, and then you talked about women, then you talked about cheesecake, and then you talked about houses, and you talked about something else. The needle from there on out is just going to get still, and more and more still. It's going to stick. But it stuck the first time it stuck. And if you're a good auditor, you notice the first time it stuck, and you cleared help on that. You see, you have to be very alert. Main use of a meter is making sure that the individual gets unstuck when you've stuck him. Now, where, where an individual is demonstrating disabilities in creativeness, he has accepted too much help, which has then betrayed him. Taking somebody into a university to teach him how to write probably re-stimulates people who have tried to teach him how to write and tell stories and have then dumped him in the river when he became too much competition. Get the idea? So that somebody tries to help him write in this life and he runs into a help betrayal in some earlier situation which is quite brutal and violent, don't you see? He wouldn't clear up at all by simply running the situation in this life. You know, let's, let's clear up his writing by running his university classes. Because obviously he could write before he went to the university. When he came out, he couldn't. Standard situation. <laughs> See, somebody helped him create. Now, it's no good actually to blame that situation and try to audit it because it isn't going to go anyplace. What, what you've got to do is get this class of thing. This class of thing. Uh, truly, as you run into these things, adventure is with us again. You, you remember when we were running in grounds in secondary school? We were running bloody adventure. We had pre-clears rolling around on the floor and rolled up in prenatal balls, you know, and, and screaming at high C that no human voice could possibly emit or tolerate. And we had a situation there where we had lots of adventure, tremendous adventure. you got another one. Because help never gets upset this side of stark violence. You can't upset people's help by slapping them on the wrist. You can by they offer you something, you start cutting their fingers off one quarter of an inch at a time, they're liable to get a little upset. But the magnitude of violence required to aberrate a thetan on the subject of creativeness escapes the modern imagination. I won't bother to give you any examples. You start running men, a man, which would take care of all things, a body, a woman, a baby, a mother, a house, a planet, a son, anything that apparently is the case combination. Be willing to change your mind if you're wrong. Don't beat one to death that isn't producing results, it says right in the auditor's code. And all of a sudden, you'll get some kind of an idea of what it takes to aberrate a Phaeton. 
There's plenty of magnitude. There's plenty of betrayal, plenty of injustice, large, gobby doses of gore. <laughs> For somebody to come along and say that some little girl met some little boy and they noticed things. And then ever afterward, the little boy was aberrated and later on became a homosexual. For anybody to put this out of fact showed him to be a very bad investigator or a damn liar or both. Sex, you say, is one of the primary factors of cr creative aberration. To create an aberration by sex, you would think, is dead easy. No, the guy's at least creating something with sex, even if it's only, a, even if it's only trouble. <laughs> You're to some degree on creativeness. It's not nearly as aberrative as a whole group as all, all sexual incident of great magnitude would, would, would not be as aberrative as a great group of people that get together to build a building, the free clearest part of the group, and he's building the building too, and they're all building along, he's accepting part of it, everything's going along fine. One day the rest of the group turns around to him and says, get out of here. And they ejected him. They wouldn't have anything to do with him anymore. And he could never find out what he did. I'm afraid that sort of thing, a third dynamic aberration, would be much stronger. A fellow who was going along quite happily, he was being a man, and all of a sudden grew great alligator scales all the way down his back. That'd be worse than any sexual aberration. He'd be ejected from the human race, some fashion, or he'd become such a tremendous curiosity and become so wealthy exhibiting these scales, he'd be such a loser or such a successful boy on the subject that the thing would aberrate his normal ideas. Uh, more importantly, some individuals have been able to make it for years, generations, millennia, as, let's say, an officer of police. Always been able to make it, all the way up the line, always been able to make it, uh, made better societies, made people stand in line, created things, everybody respected, you know. Boy, you're just going along fine. One day he's the emperor's captain of bodyguard, or something of the sort. And they, he didn't do any treason, so they arrest him for treason because they want to get him out of the road or something of the sort. And then they garrote him, but they decide not to garrote him at the last one. They put him on public display, and then they disrate him, and he finds out that his wife did it all in the first place. And that's the end of that life. See, he went on for years, generations, millennia, as a terrific success in creating societies from this particular viewpoint. So it's obviously a successful mock-up. Now he's taught, not just once, but maybe the next 16 times he tries it, that when you become a police officer or a captain of police or the chief of bodyguards or something like that, you get executed. That's the first thing that happens. Now he has two data which cannot compute, and we get the basis of every obsessive mock-up and computational situation on a case. The situation cannot be computed. And one day one day he runs into a friend who is a cop who has been guilty of killing a wife, and we find him as an auditor. We find him in the valence of the cop who kills his wife. We say, good heavens, what is all this about? What is this all about? We say, well, obviously, wife killing. No, it's just being a cop. Run help on cops all you'd have to do. All of a sudden the case would fall apart, he'd be able to mock up, he'd be able to get the show on the road in all directions. But if you were unlucky, you could go for a long time without finding out 
that it was a cop valence he was up against. You'd be running mothers and mother-in-laws and babies and houses and perambulators and bicycles and mayors and politicians and soldiers and sailors and cows and almost everything. And nothing's happening. I say, it's all right. I'm getting all right. I enjoy auditing. I enjoy being audited. <laughs> and one day, well, you get smart, and you start to get interested in the preclear, and you talk to him a little bit, and find out the one thing he has never mentioned was that he went to the university and roomed with, afterwards, a fellow who was a police officer who killed his wife and who was executed. He'll tell you at first that he didn't even know the guy, but this will dawn. You get the idea? You suddenly get this type of person. You run that type of person on help. Not that individual, but that type of individual, and you run help on it in brackets. The case falls apart, and he can do step six like a startled gazelle. And they really can do step six. I've audited them. Now, the point I'm making is then the actual commands of step six are relatively simple. They are the subject of publications. All you're doing when you're running step six is giving the individual practice in simple form mock-up. You have him mock up something in front of his body and keep him going away, mock up behind his body and keep him going away, below his body, above his body, the right his body, the left his body, each time keeping it from going away, each time asking him if he did so and thanking him for it. And then you run uh, simple mock-ups, front, behind, left, right, above, below the body, on holding them still. And then simple mock-ups again. A lot of auditors miss on this. They just have him mock up anything. You want him to mock up simple mock-ups, cubes, circles, little things. Uh, and you run the same type of thing on make it a little more solid and ask him if he did. And you get then an individuality uh, improving, improving, showing up, being more and more able to create, and at the same time getting more and more confidence in creativeness. So you'd say help makes it possible for him to create, and step six gives him the confidence in practice of actual creation. This is clearing. He eventually winds up without a reactive bank, and he's happy about it because he can mock one up any time he wants to, but he doesn't have to now. The fact of clearing was for many years barred from our knowledge by the simple fact that we could not ourselves believe the horrible truth that people, through irresponsibility, mocked up all of their own difficulties. There's no good to merely challenge them and tell them they've got to assume all these responsibilities. You've got to sneak up on them much more quietly than that. And we can do so now with clear procedure. Therefore, clearing is a fact. Clearing can be done. And you can do it. Thank you.